It's June 12th, 1951, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Ariel, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. If I asked you what a boater was, the invention patented today in history in 1951, I think you'd be forgiven for guessing perhaps a hat or something to do with um, boating. But no, it was a distinctly polite and 1950s name for an envelope-like plastic cover that soups up urine and faeces from a baby's diaper, the precursor to pampers, huggies and all disposable nappies still in common use today. Yeah, and the boater was the invention of Marion Donovan, who was a housewife and inventor, who called it the boater because she said at the time it looked like a boat. I mean, she later it does gave, a bit. She, mm. It does a bit. She later gave other accounts of how she came up with the name, but basically she invented a lot of things, and I think probably as the years went by, she lost track of the exact origins of some of them. <laughs> but she had been, you know, she'd very much followed the path of what a good upper-middle-class girl at the time did. You know, she was the daughter of a factory owner, and she went to college. She was an assistant beauty editor at Vogue, but then she got married. She gave it all up she resigned from her job moved to Connecticut to become a housewife and mother and so it was in this capacity in this new life that she ran up against the problem of changing nappies and at the time you know I think a lot of people now have returned to using cloth nappies because they're more sustainable but the modern versions have adopted loads of convenient features from disposable ones like the elasticated legs and waist and the kind of the hourglass shape the more absorbent materials at this point they were literally just wrappings and so because they weren't particularly you know they weren't leak proof they weren't waterproof they were only limitedly absorbing it meant that if you were changing a nappy most of the time you were also changing a full set of clothes or you were changing bedding if the child was asleep That was it. She said that the inspiration had come about because she was constantly changing wet crib sheets and was really just getting dissatisfied with all the available nappy options, which basically all allowed water to come through. And as you say, she had this history of invention behind her. In high school, she had developed a type of tooth cleaning powder. (laughs) So she was already an inventor before she became a mother. She was sort of following in the footsteps again as you say of her father who had not only exposed her to the fact that he was a very successful inventor he'd invented a type of lathe that had made him a really substantial fortune but he'd also allowed her to come with him when she was still a kid growing up to the factories every day and inspired in her the idea that she could do the same sort of thing and throughout the rest of her life she was tackling problems in this invention forward way where if she saw a problem her solution to it was, well, what can I sit down to do to create something that's going to be the solution to that problem? Yeah, I mean, let's not minimise as well that period that she had as a beauty editor at Vogue, because I think it's the perfect combination of experiences for the background Mm. of an inventor of products to women in the 1950s, isn't it? She had that engineering brain, she'd been brought up to believe she could invent stuff and also had the means to do so, plus the experience of marketing directly to women reflecting Mm. what women were concerned about and talking to women about different products. And once she'd made her name as the inventor of the precursor to the disposable nappy, she did an interview with Barbara Walters. And she says in that that her philosophy, her kind of invention philosophy is, what do I think will help a lot of people and most certainly will help me? Mm. Um, And, you know, it, it, it seems straightforward, but so many inventors invent stuff where you're kind of creating the problem before you come up with the solution. This was a real problem, but it was a problem that men who ran most of the manufacturing companies had not come up against because men generally in the 1950s didn't change diapers. That was a woman's role and it took a woman to say, this isn't good enough. Like, you know, we haven't got washing machines, by the way, so I'm, uh, you know, swirling feces around in my hands all day long. Yeah, I mean, the gadgets that she invented were targeted particularly to the everyday annoyances of the middle class housewife. There are things like the zippity do, which is an elastic cord you can use to zip up a dress from the back without assistance. She my wife f- would still like one of those. Well, I still think it's, I mean, <laughs> in fact, I think that would rid me of my only role in her life. <laughs> yeah, maybe don't buy one of those. Uh, she had a compact clothes hanger for small spaces, combined check and record keeping book, a circular flossing device she called the dental loop, which I really enjoy this. Apparently, she came up with the idea after watching her second husband flossing and I'm just picturing the look of total revulsion on her face as she was watching him it was um, a bit of a tension around the fingers wasn't it so you don't yeah. pull so hard yeah. on the floss Purple it's finger. got ready made holes yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. but I think 
the issue that arose from this was that the media of the time, because of the nature of the things that she was inventing, they couldn't see her as an inventor who happened to be a housewife. They portrayed her as a housewife who somehow kept stumbling into inventing things. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like an idiot savant. Yeah, yeah, like a magazine profile claimed that she was, quote, baffled by any mechanism more intricate than an egg beater, despite the <laughs> fact that she had practically grown up in a factory. Well, even the New York Times obituary, which really sounds like it was written in the 1950s, but was actually in the late 90s, kind of plays into this. It said, as a striking woman who was forever being likened to Myrna Loy when she wasn't being likened to Rosalind Russell, Mrs. Donovan had no trouble getting to see the top executives of leading paper companies. But when they heard her idea, they laughed. So she funded it herself because she was in a position to be able to do that. She pulled down their family shower curtain, cut it into pieces yeah. <laughs> and sewed it into a waterproof cover to show the concept. And then once she got snubbed by manufacturers, just kept developing it herself, ended up using breathable parachute cloth uh, with an insert for an absorbent panel. I mean, mm. you look at it now and you think it's still some way off the kind of uber convenient devices that we have today. I mean, this is not Pampers. But it was the icebreaker. It was the way into the conversation. Once you saw mm. the boater, you sort of understood what needed to happen to make disposable nappies and what a huge change that would be. And once it actually got stocked at Saks Fifth Avenue, it became an instant smash hit in 1949. And, of course, she owned all the intellectual property. Mm. Yeah, and by this time she was already working on her next idea, which was an even closer precursor of the disposable nappy. It was a absorbent paper nappy that was a single-use item. But even though the boater had been such a smash success, male executives weren't really interested in investing in the disposable nappy. As far as they were concerned, there was no demand for disposable nappies. Women were happy with the status quo. And also there was a belief that people wouldn't want to pay. You know, once you've got a few cloth nappies, you're set, you just have to keep washing them. The idea that a family would be willing to keep paying for packages of disposables, that was seen as prohibitively expensive. And interestingly, what they didn't consider and one of the reasons that disposables did take off was the fact that it wasn't something that only appealed to the affluent. It particularly appealed to families who didn't have washing machines. As you touched on, Ollie, you know, it wasn't commonplace in every home. And a woman would later write to Procter & Gamble saying that Pampers had changed her life because she was walking down multiple flights of her apartment building with a pail of dirty nappies to take to the laundrette every day. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, well, two years later, she sold her company and her patents to Keiko Corporation for a million dollars, which must have been an enormous sum for the time. Equivalent to $10 million today, apparently. Right. And she kept inventing from there. So Donovan's daughter, Christine, later recalled growing up in a house that basically doubled as an R&D lab. She said, mm. Mom was always drawing and working with materials, wire or plastic or nylon or paper. She had an office above the garage, but frankly, everywhere was her drawing board. The kitchen was where Mum was and something was always cooking, but not food, heating irons and sealants and so on. <laughs> So again, it kind of, even that depiction of her flies right in the face of the idea that she was a woman who didn't know her way around machines and the materials that she was working with. Yeah, I think a lot of other people would have been quite bitter if they'd basically invented the disposable paper nappy and they were laughed out of the room and then somebody else invented it and made millions and millions of dollars. But she really was not perturbed at all, maybe because she was like just rich and she just carried on living her life. She carried on inventing. She obtained an architecture degree from Yale University in 1958 when she was 41. Mm. And designed her own home. <laughs> yeah, she designed her own yeah. house. Yeah, she was just a really, really cool lady. I mean, her daughter said that she would invent things around the house as well that she didn't market. Like she had a glass ring installed in her car to hold her coffee cup before you had cup holders in cars. Mm. Well, disposable nappies themselves really took off in the late 50s. Procter & Gamble came out with Pampers in 1961. At first, the prices were just too high and they found that the right price was about six cents per nappy. And it's at that stage that it became the thing that it needed to be, I suppose, which is something that you can put on and take off and not have to think about too much because it's a disposable commodity. It's funny as well to think that originally uh, marketers thought that people wouldn't pay a premium for a disposable product because it's not mm. as long lasting as the cloth nappy. I mean, that's the whole point, isn't it? You don't want something that's full of in your house and you pay a premium <laughs> for that. Uh, if you can afford to, you pay a premium for the better quality ones, don't you? It's even more yeah. wasteful in a way, but you pay for yeah. ones with all the straps and gadgets and whatever because if you're time poor, it's worth it. It's worth four times as much for the nappy that isn't going to leak. I mean, that's a priceless commodity. 
Yes, and specifically not to have to get any poo on your hands. <laughs> Though I found out only doing this research that most <laughs> nappy companies... Is that why you had two daughters for research for this episode? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really went for it. <laughs> but I found out that most nappy manufacturers recommend that you take the feces out and flush it down the toilet before you dispose of your nappy. Do they? The idea being that then less waste goes into landfill. Mm. But do you know how many people do that? Zero. 0.5% apparently. <laughs> I just think if you're the person who does that, then you're the person who doesn't use single-use nappies, aren't you? I mean, we've been talking about nappies and diapers interchangeably, I think out of deference for our transatlantic audience. But any <laughs> Brit who mentions diapers will be scorned as hopelessly Americanized. but it's actually an English word. It's even found in Shakespeare. But mm. what happened was that by the time nappy took over, the original word diaper had been taken to the States by the colonists and remained there. Good fact. Do you know which Shakespeare play it was? I want to say Taming of the Shrew. Okay. Taming of the Poo. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Tomorrow. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you do not mention one question, something which you later rely on in court. Love the show? Support the show. Patreon.com slash Retrospector. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.